Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Royal Sussex Live. Welcome one and all. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, let me see who was here first. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, I didn't say the name, did I? Okay. Oh, all right. So we have Rodney Jackson was here first. Love Wins Movement, Katie B., and a host of friends and others. Okay, let me grab my slides and we can get going. I don't think we'll be here more than an hour. Of course, it seems like I always say that. And then three hours later, but I don't think we'll be here more than an hour. Okay. I'll do my best. Okay. Hey, uh, Susie Q. All right. Ah, oh, perfect. There we go. There we go. Okay. As you know, I was editing a video earlier and just got carried away. Um, okay. So we are not ready for King William. Definitely not ready. And I don't even have to deal with that punk and I'm not ready. I could imagine how the rest of the world feels. Or should I say, I could imagine how the people of the uh, United Kingdom feel knowing that this heretic is uh, destined to be king and just not fit for purpose. He's not, he's not really king material. Uh, petulant, petty, childish, uh, insecure, all of those things, not really king material. Um, oh, you know what? I didn't put the troll spray on, did I? Lordy have mercy. I did not put on the troll spray. Hold on, you guys. That is essential. Uh, that way we can keep the riffraff out of here. Okay. Okay. Troll spray. Troll spray. Okay. Let's go back one week as per usual. By the way, I saw someone left a message in the um, comments saying that they were unable to... Uh, go to the live chat. Um, oh, no. How did that happen? So um, I tell you, make sure, make sure you haven't unsubscribed. Yeah, please make sure that you have not unsubscribed because that can be a problem. And sometimes when people are not able to enter the live chat, it is because they, by mistake, have unsubscribed. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, please just do make sure you check that out and, um, you know, see see what what you can do on your end. Otherwise, I'll see what I can do on my end, but uh, chances are, you may have just simply unsubscribed. That happens sometimes by mistake because hitting that bell icon, um, you do that to subscribe and then you also do that for the notifications. And I think they should, instead of using a symbol, I think they should just have something that says notification and, and that should remedy that, but uh, they don't. And um, I know as, as, Odd as it sounds, they don't really listen to me, um, you know, in, in the management of this place. So, um, yeah, try that. Really? Oh, okay. Okay. I will fix that. All right. Um, let's keep it moving. Oh, by the way, this is um, Sam McAllister. Yeah, Sam McAllister. She's the one who wrote the book Scoop. And as you can see, look at her and look at 
what is her name? Lori Pipey, Piper Lori. Uh, take a look at her and take a look up there at the actress who played her in the movie. Um, she loved her, I guess it's Gucci. She wore this big Gucci pin. And I'd never seen Sam McAllister before. I suppose that's short for Samantha. But my goodness, don't she look just like um, the actual uh, woman? The Well, the actress looks just like her. Um, yeah, I mean, that is amazing. That is amazing. The likeness is amazing. I mean, sometimes they don't really get it right. But here, I would say they really captured the look of everyone involved. I am super, super impressed. So I'm, and the odd chance that there is someone from the making of that movie that is watching Royal Sussex. Um, do know that I am impressed. Super, super impressed. Okay. Uh, Lizzie 34, let me see. Lizzie said, oh, let me highlight you here. Lizzie says, uh, no to King William. They need to be educated. Uh, he should have, yeah, he should have just said, uh, we, yes, we are very, <laughs> yes, we are a very racist family. Yes, that, that would actually be an honest answer, I would suppose, from them. But uh, wow, what a line that was, wasn't it? We are very much not a racist. That was an odd answer, wasn't it? We are very much not a racist family. I do think that answer was a bit odd, if not to mention off-putting. But thank you so much for the super chat. And thank you so much for being here. Okay. Um... Hello, Mackenzie, TMCD. I'm so glad you're here. We had a little trouble getting you on here. Uh, is Big Mama here? Hey, Big Mama. Emerald Derrick. Okay. Hey, Lydia Washington. Okay. Let us keep it moving. So you may recognize this um, front page. This is the Tatler. And this caused a lot of controversy during the global pandemic. They asked, um, oh gosh, what is her name? Pastor Nick? Her name should be there somewhere. Anyway, they asked her to write this article. And well, the article was an honest, well, uh, assessment of the situation, such as it was, based on some of the comments that were made. Like, for instance, Kate did say she was very tired and she felt tired. And um, <laughs> Anna Post Postanak, thank you. And isn't she uh, a descendant of the... Um, of the, uh, what do you call it? The the Russian royal family, the Tsar Nicholas and all the rest of them. I believe she's a descendant of those people. Her family fled the Russian revolution. And um, well, anyway, they have been living in the UK ever since those who made it. As we know, some of them were turned away or refused. And anyway, so Anna Pasenak, um didn't I made a short video with her, didn't I? Let me see if I could find that one. Let me see if I can find that one. Uh, yeah, I did a video short with her. Uh, okay. Oh, man. Well, good luck finding that one, huh? That was so long ago. Anna Postanak. Well, anyway, um, she had a lot to say. I got to give you the link to that podcast. It really, I, I could, it was all I could think about today was Anna Posnick and, and that uh, podcast. Oh my God. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I tell you, um, it, it really makes me, 
uh, reevaluate everything that's been said and done thus far. And um, let me see here. Oh, here it is right here. Okay, so take a listen. Um, it seemed to me that Harry is absolutely telling the truth. I think we've learned that there is a far greater level of manipulation from the royal household with the press. It is indeed a dirty game. And uh, the, I happen to know that the royal uh, households do brief against each other. So um, I think we've learned that, you know, the, it all is not what it seems necessarily when the House of Windsor uh, presents um, a very, you know, uh, above board front. Um, and I think that a lot of what was said in the latest episodes is concerning and also deeply damaging to the monarchy. I also think that um, Harry was talking the exact truth when he said that, um, of course, what was problematic for him and Meghan was their star quality and their popularity post their fantastic Australia trip. And, you know, history has shown that if you're not in the direct line of succession and you steal too much oxygen, uh, things don't end well. Um, it seemed to Okay. Okay. There you go. Um, oh man, that she said that in a podcast before, and then she had another podcast today in which she let out a truth bomb. As a matter of fact, this article, Catherine the Great was a truth bomb. Uh, Leg says body locks really screwed over Anna. Uh, what a clown. Yes, he did. And uh, thank you, Legs. What Legs is referring to is that they were threatening to sue the Tatler over this article. And when they were unable to, um, let's see, Anna Posnick actually was supposed to do a series of interviews after this article. Everybody wanted to talk about this. And there was a deal made at the Tatler, they said, listen, uh, they don't want to sue, but you cannot talk about uh, this for four months. You cannot talk about it for four months. Meanwhile, allegedly, William had called over to the uh, Daily Mail, allegedly, and had them write an article saying that um, Kate was victorious over the um, daily, uh, over the Tatler. Kate Middleton's victory over the Tatler. Yeah. And of course, that was not the case. It was actually William that uh, insists that they should, you know, pull the article. So the print article is out there. But the actual online article was uh, edited. It was removed. It was changed. And so that just goes to show you the unrelenting pressure, the massive amount of pressure that they were able to uh, bring about to change the article. Yep. Um, they made them change it under the threat of, of a libel suit, I suppose. But it was what Kate said. They just didn't like the way that it was reported. But after the Sussexes left, they were trying to play the uh, sympathy card for Kate, uh, making it seem as though, oh, the, the Black woman left this English rose with all this extra work and the burden of the children and um, how am I going to make it? Well, with a staff of 62 people, I wonder, how do you survive something like that with a staff of 62? Not to mention, uh, you got your mom to help, even though I don't think she actually has any input. Um, it, it was just a real, real mess. It was a mess. And the person who really came up short was Anna. She was the one that that um, was being excoriated in the, um, eviscerated, should I say, in the um, 
article and she was unable to respond. She couldn't say anything. But as you just heard uh, here, there she was uh, telling her truth. Uh, let me see here. So anyway, I saved a couple of sound bites earlier today, and I'm going to share them with you about this very topic. Um, oh, man, my phone has been buffering like crazy. My Wi-Fi seems to be okay. But my all of my everything seems to be buffering like crazy. It's, it's driving me nuts. But um, yeah, I I have no doubt that um, Apple is gonna do another iOS update. But right now it's a mess. He would not believe. So, for example, in the mainstream press, it is verboten to write a piece in support of Meghan and Harry. Wait, wait, wait. So when you say, you know, they must say this narrative about Meghan and Harry, mm -hmm. I mean, you mean this in the way that journalists all sort of move as a pack, right? It's not an actual dictum. No, it is an absolute um, dictum, mm -hmm. spoken and unspoken, that the newspapers do not want and will not print pieces that are wholly positive to Meghan and Harry. And you cannot write anything negative, really, about William or Kate. But this is because they're monarchists at the core? No, this is because the of the deals that have been done between the palace and the editors of these papers. Okay. If you look at the Telegraph Act, you will see four or five pieces in absolute eulogising praise of the Princess of Wales. Mm -hmm. And then the chances are on the same day, every piece about Meghan and Harry is negative. They, they literally take a baseball bat and bash this couple to pieces. And it is because of this that I have completely changed my view towards Meghan, but also towards Harry. So when Mexit happened, I thought, well, it was ill-conceived and they were acting in probably quite a petulant way and couldn't they have made it work? And what I have seen from my the books that I've written about the monarchy is that the reason the British monarchy has survived and prospered when other European monarchies has failed is they are utterly ruthless. The royal family manipulate the media. Oh, I'm telling you, I have been thinking about this all day. I am drained because of this. I've been thinking about it all day. I cannot get it out of my mind. I just can't. It is, it, it's everything we already know. But I guess what bothers me is the fact that it is just understood that that's the way it is. And out of all of these people in this machine, the British tabloid machine, out of all of the parts, pieces, cogs, and springs, and sprockets, not one, not one seems to want to stand up against it. Not one wants to speak truth. They all go along. And, and I'm telling you guys, I have Googled and I've searched the LinkedIn uh, for some of these writers. And they all seem to have a look about themselves. They all seem to have a look. And if you ever see them on, say, GB News or Talk TV, they all have a certain tone. Um, they, they all have that very snotty, arrogant tone about their, their mission to write these articles uh, to, to make sure that they serve as the gatekeepers to the Western world. And of course, their target is people of color, black women in particular. And so whether they know it to be true or not, whether they think it's right or wrong, they just do. They do. So if they say, take a bet to them, then that's what they do. They, they start writing and saying the nastiest things about someone they never met before that they know nothing about except the nasty things that they heard from the last person who was given the task of targeting them. Okay, there, there was another one that I listened to.
but I, I will uh, put the link on the community tab for you guys. Um, it's on Apple. Um, okay. The royal family. Here we go. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> well, yes, uh, um, it was the beginning of lockdown and I was asked by Tatler to do a, you know, colourful piece on Kate and what they didn't want was a puff piece. Great. And th this piece created the most enormous backlash. I, I just could not believe it. And one of the things that was levelled at me was that I had said that Kate was perilously thin. I mean, you know, as I was thinking of um, Tom Wolfe and New York social x-rays or Hollywood stars, they're all size zeros, they're all perilously thin. And that's kind of a compliment. Yes, my piece did have a very snobby side. I'm writing for Tatler. It was an article I thought would be sort of tossed aside by, you know, toffs in stately homes in Britain. Um, and anyway, everyone went berserk about that. And Kate and William said they were going to sue Tatler. So I had four months oh, in which I was rung up by the Tatler managing director and told, and I had the world's media saying, you know, please, can you speak? Please. And I was told, please don't speak. So for four months, I did not speak, which was very annoying. So I had another book to publish oh, and wouldn't interview me because they said we can't talk to you unless you discuss Tatler. <laughs> no <again."> nightmare, <laughs> <laughs> nightmare. Exactly, that aggrieved me even more. I cannot discuss Tatler again. And this is really interesting in light of what's happening with the media and the palace today. So I remember vividly. It was a September Thursday evening, and I was rung up by Louisa Parker Bowles, Camilla's niece, who was then managing uh, director of Tatler, and she said, "Don't worry, it's all been sorted with the Condé Nast lawyers, uh, William and Kate. You know they're not going to sue." But the one thing is you absolutely must not discuss this. So you can imagine my uh, consternation on Sunday when I go and get the Sunday newspapers and front cover of the mail on Sunday is Kate's victory over Tatler double page spread on me absolutely oh, you know my going, god yes and and I knew that Tatler hadn't leaked it I knew that I hadn't leaked it so I knew that the leak had come straight from Kensington Palace and a year later the journalist who was asked to write the piece verified that William had rung up the editor of the mail on Sunday at, at that Friday morning and somebody from his office went to have lunch with them and they planted that piece the royal family manipulate the media. Mm. The, the, I'm talking about the print media, mm. the British print media, in a way you simply would not believe. So, for example, in the mainstream press, it is verboten to write a piece in support of Meghan and Harry. Wait, wait, wait. So when you say, you know, they must say this narrative, monarchy works. and it's Okay, so there you have it. There you have it. And I actually found the article... Uh, victory for Kate Middleton as Society Bible Tatler caves in his cruel, snobbish, <coughs> excuse me, woman shaming demolition job. You know, and, and and as always, you can read something like that and say, what about what you did to Megan? What about the way they treated Megan? So a uh, woman shaming demolition job by deleting barbs about Carol, Pippa, and a poster of William on the future Duchess's bedroom wall. Uh, Tatler has cut huge swaps from the online profile of the Duchess of Cambridge after the Society Bible was accused of publishing a string of lies. The magazine has caved in and removed almost a quarter of the piece. In particular, cruel and snobby barbs aimed at Kate's mother, Carol Middleton, and sister Pippa. It comes after Kensington Palace instructed its lawyers to demand uh, the inaccuracies and false representations be removed. The July-August edition of Tatler, which was published in May under the cover Story Catherine the Great details claims now deleted by Kate. Of, I'm sorry, that Kate 38 felt exhausted and trapped. Well, that is what they were pushing. That is what they were pushing at the time. Following Harry and Meghan's decision to step back from royal life, was perilously thin, like Princess Diana had even consulted psychic with William. Um, but the Mail on Sunday understands it was the criticism of Kate Middleton's family that caused the greatest upset. Oh, really? Oh, really? Initially, Tatler refused to remove anything from the Internet, despite palace fury with editor Richard Denon 
insisting he stood behind the reporting of Anna Pasternak and her sources. However, the Cambridge's lawyers pointed out that the Kensington Palace had not been given the opportunity to comment on the specific content of uh, Pasternak's uh, feature, much of which was disputed. Eventually, both sides agreed that a chunk would be cut from the online profile, uh, which was done this week, four months after its publication. The erased paragraphs include claims that William was obsessed with his mother-in-law, that Carol, 65, is a terrible snob, and that Pippa, 37, is too regal and try hard. Uh, and only reference Tatler has made uh, to the climb down is a sentence at the end of the piece saying it had been edited. Mm. Well, so yeah, they took a quarter of it out. They took all the best bits and removed it. How about that? That was the Daily Mail article, by the way. Um, or should I say Kate's victory lap, William's victory lap. Anybody who's ever assumed that, um, and you know, I guess the other reason why I was frustrated is because when I try to explain this to people uh, that are outside of our community, um, I still get the feeling that there's doubt or how could anything be so awful? Um, and there you have it, the eight, the hate, the hateful eight for hire. These are just a few, not all, but just a few of the people that has been doing the bidding of the institution. Uh, you have starring as no neck. You have uh, Sarah Vine and the sad little man, uh, Dan Wooten, and Maureen, of course, that is Richard Eden, and Piss Moron, well, the name speaks for itself, uh, Loose Gear, <laughs> Jabba No Neck, yeah, Jabba No Neck, and of course, um, what is that, Lying Levine, and... Um, Oh, gosh, what is that up there? Let me see. Let me pull that down. Okay. Uh, okay, Dick Palmer. <laughs> okay, I, I get that, actually. I get it. Um, yeah, you, you could take that another way. But anyway, um, uh, that's just a few of them. And every day, every day, they fatten up their wallets. They fill their coffers with this blood money, this dirty, filthy money from this hate campaign. It is truly a campaign of hate. Now, um, the son loses 66 million pounds. Well, I posted the video earlier. I won't play it here. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's. Uh, I actually worked on that thumbnail myself. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. And I still think about this. Uh, Victoria Newton was with Charles on his last working day as the Prince of Wales. He hosted me with typical generosity. That's the same Victoria Newton that was so emotionally um, I guess uh, shaken by the criticism of Kate Middleton recently. She's the one who uh, signed off, of course, on the article saying that, you know, Jeremy Clarkson should hurl feces and such. She was the one who signed off on that. The same one who was so shaken by the way Kate Middleton was being treated. So she had them write a headline, back off Kate. And of course, that sent a signal throughout the entire um, 
tabloid and, and news industry that it won't be tolerated. Now, if she had the power to do that, to help Kate Middleton and to help her and her mental health and well-being, it seemed like that same authority could have been used to spare Megan, but it was not. And so while the world has uh, been very sympathetic as of late because of the appearance on the bench, I stand firm where I've always stood because no one benefited from um, that type of journalism, that type of hate. Nobody benefited more than Kate Middleton. And while we're trying to save Kate, to save her mental health and well-being, to create a positive atmosphere where she can flourish without the weight and pressure of public opinion, I still have to ask, where was all of that energy for Megan? And that's the, the other reason why they had Kate go and sit on that bench, because there were too many people saying, what about Megan? That shut that down. That totally shut that down, at least for the greater public. That totally shut that down. So um, after using focus groups or whatever service they use to come up with their idea of what to do about Kate, I have to say it's been very effective. This is Victoria Newton. She is the one, I'm sorry, she is the editor of The Sun. Uh, she gave the nod for the horrific piece written by Jeremy Clarkson to be published this morning. She appeared on the BBC, Laura, whatever, um, when, I were, when I say influential women enable misogyny, I ain't making it up. And that's exactly what has happened here. And she's holding, I've, I've shown you before, but I'm not going to do it right now, but she's holding a picture of um, William, Kate, and the kids, where Kate's wearing that brown polka dot mess, um, walking hand in hand and smiling. This is the same woman who seems to make a conscious decision to hurt Megan while she's trying to uplift the um, English Rose. And then they say, why do you call it racism? It's not always race. Well, I can't really think of what else it could be. It was the same with Barack Obama. It was the same with all the black mayors and all the black governors across the United States. There was a common thread where there was this very loud dog whistle, loud enough for humans to perceive, but how dare you call it racism? Liz Jones, Charles, we need you to be okay so that we're okay. Uh, we're not ready for William yet. So um, a couple of the squaddies had some things to say about that, and I thought I would share it with you. Um, so to avoid people entering their, you know, their uh, social media, I omitted the names, but I put it in the red square so you would know what exactly is a quote from a squaddie. It seems to me everyone's panicking at the prospect of King Willie because nobody anticipated him ruling without Harry there as Cinderella to guide and contain him. Oh, that's brilliant. And of course, to play the crucial role of scapegoat. And um, I believe this was from the article, this other part. I think of my own, I'm sorry, I think of my own dad, still, still so handsome and active, who once slayed Nazis, uh, struck down by cancer, age 80. And the only thing he whispered to my mom was, tell the little girls, I'm so sorry. No offense, but none of us is quite ready for William. 
I want to see Kate flying like a kite again for years, uh, not caged and burdened. We need someone sage, stable. Um, I'll say it again. We don't need any more change. I was just starting to enjoy. Oh, God, this is where I'd start to hurl. I was just starting to enjoy Charles and Camilla uh, creaking and cracking on. For the first time, I can describe them both as sweet, as sweet. Describe them both as sweet. The, the two people who uh, tortured Diana, the two that drove her out of the country, they did everything but uh, sit in the front seat of the Mercedes, if you ask me. They did everything but sit in the front seat of the Mercedes. At least I don't th suppose they were there. And of course, this was an article from Tina Brown. Um, I haven't shared it before because, of course, in order to justify saying the least critical thing, about the rest of the people in the family. You have to make sure that you say something negative and nasty about Harry and Meghan. So with that, I'll just share a portion. I'm told the turmoil behind the scene has been intense, resulting in what has felt like a series of uh, baffling press screw-ups. We hear often of Prince Harry's hatred of the press. If possible, Prince William while concealing it better, hates the press even more. I could not tell. I swear to God, I can't tell the way he gets along with them. His bloody-minded determination to stick his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth's script of never complain, never explain, um, is magical thinking in the era of the social media uh, uh, ma maelstrom uh, creating a vacuum filled by rumors and deranged conspiracy theories. The almost simultaneous uh, news of Charles' cancer has put William and Catherine in frightening proximity to ascending the throne just when they had hoped to span, uh, hope for a span of years to parent their children. I'm sorry. I had to bang my hand on the table. <laughs> they always use those children as an excuse. Uh, anyway, to parent their children out of the public eye, the prospect of it, I'm told, is causing them intense anxiety. I don't want to be rude, but parent their children? Parent their children? Isn't that what the nannies are for? so that they could literally helicopter in and then go about their business when they choose. I don't get, I don't get how a two parent household requires both parents there the maximum amount of time, which is the polar opposite of uh, the queen and Philip traveling for six months, leaving the kids behind. I, I don't understand why people are okay with that. You could have one parent work and the other stay home. Then the other go out and work and the other one stay home. You get what I'm saying? Like a seesaw. That way they could fulfill their obligation to that 354 million pounds a year that sustains the royal family as opposed to doing the least bit of anything and using the kids as an excuse why you cannot work. They have had more excuses why they have not been full-time royals. They have never been full-time royals. I wager you they have worked more since the queen has died than they have the entire time that they were married. I promise you, I believe that to be true. 
They have not done a lot at all. What they call work is more like a, a high T. But I digress. Let me continue. So that they could parent the kids. Uh, okay, so we have another red box. That means a quote from a squatty. Uh, it says here, Willie, whose wife allegedly has cancer, is spending sleepless nights worrying about how he'll cope as king and is all Harry's fault for abandoning his Cinderella duties. This is the same Willie who's been briefing for years how his father is incompetent and he'd make a better king. Well, that is exactly what's been going on. They have had these leaks and these articles ready to rule, um, Will and Kate ready. They have been doing that for years. And it has only stopped uh, since the queen has died. Although he had, uh, William, he is still throwing a few things out there. Like for instance, right after the coronation, he started talking about all the virtues of what's coming when he becomes king. And there you can see William and Kate feeling intense anxiety about accession to throne, Diana biographer claims. William and Kate fill in, blah, blah, blah. Let me see. The prince and princess of Wales are feeling intense anxiety about taking over from Charles III. Uh, princess Diana's biographer has claimed undergoing treatment of cancer has reduced public. Kate has also disclosed. Okay, yeah. Now, um, oh, and that's, there's Tina Brown right there. The prospect of it, I am told, is causing them... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I've never shared that article with you, because it's kind of a big fat nothing burger. I, I like the comments um, from the uh, squatties more than I care for the article. It was in the um, New York Times, by the way. Um, and that's really bad when someone's response to the article is better than the article. Uh, another response right here. The single father parent attempt failed to launch. And I love that for him. His father is not going to give him what his grandmother gave his father. Now, so far, that was one voice that was speaking. But this is another squatty who made that comment. And as you can see right there, Prince William expects his control over the monarchy to grow likely likely leading to clash with King Charles. Now, they said that back in um, the day after Christmas, 2023, last year. And then over here, that looks like a Daily Beast font. Uh, Prince William is the air, is in air mode, leading to conflict with King Charles. Oh, yeah, Tom Sykes, that is a uh, Daily Beast. Yeah, that was an article from Daily Beast, the other... I believe it was New York Post. Prince William expects more influence and control over the monarchy. I don't know why. He's not ready. He's not ready. Uh, Judy Matasset, thank you so much for the super sticker. And thank you for being a member of Royal Sussex. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And thank you. I think it was Lisa, the squatty, that bought this big, gigantic cup for me. I tell you, this cup goes every place I go. I love this cup. It is massive. <laughs> 40 ounces of agua. So I'm drinking more water. But, um, yeah, that is like, like an appendage. I keep it nearby all the time. Okay, and continuing. All right, and then back to the original um, squatty. It says right here, some people find it easier to tear things down while some naturally build things up. It's clear that he, ever since he was little, ruining other people's birthday parties, Willie has always been the terror down of things. 
a terror down of things. I was satisfied with William the Terror, you know, T E R R O. <laughs> I was satisfied with that one. Uh, let's see. Joan Lawman. Thank you so much for the super sticker and thank you for being a member of Royal Sussex. Okay. Now, um, this is how things started off for the year. A new royal era begins only for things to descend into like Kate and William under pressure. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. That one was February 2023. The other one is October 2022. I love those covers. I love those covers. I do, I, I do believe that from time to time that this is actually one palace briefing to the other. I really do believe that. And I believe certain things that, especially certain things that Charles finds it difficult to say to his son, he actually uses the media to kind of conjole him and, you know, try to put him on the right path to set him straight, if you will. Uh, Ebony Unicorn says, it's very sad and telling that at 40, Willie is not ready to rule. Shaking my head, poor George doesn't stand a chance. Thank you so much for that, Ebony Unicorn. As you know, I have been very uh, curious as to know who has been raising George. Now, we know that Charles is not very hands-on with William. And for some odd reason, they're trying to make us believe that Charles has had all of this interaction with Kate and that he's been guiding Kate and he's taken Kate under his wing I said yesterday, I think it was, I believe that they're trying to set up some scenario where Kate will actually do some of the work that William is supposed to do. And I don't know how that works out because Kate is not administrative material. William has all of the authority of a dictator but he doesn't have enough sense to go with it. So maybe right now they're putting Kate through a crash course of, I don't know, managing the monarchy because Charles will not be here and William's word will be law. And he needs someone to try to, um, I don't know, keep him calm to 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 nudge him along in a very cautious way otherwise he is going to implode those people that kiss up to him day after day they are there for power and influence they don't want to be king they couldn't if they wanted to but they they're not in awe of william the only thing they care about is how much power comes with their position. And so the only way to really, you know, control William is to appeal to his vanity. The way to control him is to make him seem more intelligent than what he really is. And for Kate, constant reassurance is necessary to get the most out of her but I think that they're trying to set up something to, I don't know, give Kate tools that she'll need to deal with William once he puts that hat on. Yeah. Now, if we see her with plasters more often than not, we'll find... <laughs> if she's sporting those bandages even more in the future like she has in the past, then we'll find out that something is not jamming, right? Something is not jamming. Something is not is not what it should be. Um, and of course, if in the future she's missing for, I don't know, 30 to 60 to 90 days again, and she's not expecting a child, 
spin wheels know that um, she has found a way to deal with William. Anyway, let me take a sip of my drink. Hint, hint. She'll find a way to deal with things. There's, there's other ways. Uh, Anna Boyd, thank you so much for the super sticker and watching Royal Sussex. Uh, Kate wants out. Uh, is it over? So, as we know, the Inquirer gets it right sometimes. And it's amazing the things that they are just, you know, they, they were, listen, on the day that Charles announced his cancer, that was the publishing date of the Inquirer that said Kate's cancer battle. So before you all write them off, I repeat, Kate announced her cancer on, what was it, March the 22nd? Charles announced his cancer, not the surgery, but the cancer on February the 5th. And on that same date of February the 5th, Kate Middleton uh, was on the front page of the Inquirer, an American gossip rag, and the caption was Kate's cancer crisis or battle or crisis or whatever, the same day. So when they say that Kate wants out, marriage crisis rocks the royals, with everything mysterious that has been happening, you know, sometimes adults, married adults, reach an impasse where there's just no way to work things out. No way. And even though that so much is at stake, if they are not happy with each other, they are not happy with each other. And again, Kate sitting on that bench solved a lot of problems because not only were we talking about <clears throat> things that they would rather uh, people not discuss publicly, but the American media was talking about the state of their marriage. The American media was discussing the state of their marriage. So whatever alleged differences they may or may not have, Again, there's the inquirer saying what other people are thinking. Rethink life after health horror. And what else is that? Frantic William gets blindsided. Huh. Okay. And then over here, let's see. Kate tears off her ring. William fights for his marriage. Now, you see, I think that's in reverse. <laughs> what is the date on that? Oh, God, I can't see that. But anyway, um, oh, Lord, I better see it because I don't want people to accuse me of ignoring Michelle Obama again. That is April 1st, 2024, I think. Okay. Okay. A uh, person who was so rude to me. <laughs> I don't want to look in the comments and see that Barron deliberately uh, refused to announce the date because he thought it was associated with Michelle Obama. So anyway, now I can sleep. Embattled princess takes historic action to protect her kids, her title, and her future as palace staff scramble to hide the truth. Listen, you all. Something is wrong and something has gone astray in that institution. We all know that. Even Anna Pasternak says that there's inconsistencies with everything and she doesn't have an answer. A lot of people don't have answers. Most of the people in the tabloid media do not know what is going on, not the whole story. They don't know. They have been left in the dark. And I think that is why they were um, using so much coded language with uh, Will and Kate earlier this year, because 
they are feeling a bit left in the lurch. But I believe that somehow, some way, they restructured their approach. Um, and now everybody seems to be on board with the same message, even if they don't all have the same answers. But it is all very well organized. It, and, you know, I know what I'm looking at because I've watched the Republicans do this for years. The Republicans, they start off their day with the same talking points. They end the day with the same talking points. That is how the Republican Party has managed to um, gain so much power in the United States is because everyone's on message. Everyone's on the same message. Everyone from the, the, the dumbest person on Fox News to the senior most member of the House of Representatives, they all have the same talking points. William, the next act. Uh, well, that was one of those Tatler puff pieces. As you can see, every time they want William to seem strong and capable, they put him in uniform because he, well, I can't say that word, but we know what he looks like when he's not wearing his hat. Um, and they don't want people to look at him that way. So they want him to seem like this very strong, courageous leader and so they put on all those ropes and braids and pins and buckles and stuff. Those are the images that they prefer to use when it's a serious puff piece about what's coming next, which is so weird because I'm sure subliminally it sends the message to people uh, expressing his authority as the future monarch and head of state. But the truth is he's as weak as water and he's never really successfully done anything in the military. Um, he was an air ambulance person. And even with that, he didn't work all the time. So, and then over here, there it is, Kate Cancer Battle. And you could see the date, February 5th, 2024. That is just incredible. That is incredible. That is like the mother of coincidence that they would have that there as a publishing date. Now, I don't know when the article was written, but the publishing date, February 5th, the very day that Charles uh, publicly disclosed that he has cancer. But as in both uh, cases, they won't tell you what kind of cancer. They won't tell you what kind. That is uh, privileged information, and we are not privileged to know it. So they're going to keep that under the hats. But it's just an, an incredible coincidence. Wow. Oh, well. Uh, and then right here, these are just a handful of the things. This is the last thing I was grabbing when I was uh, <laughs> stalling at the beginning I can never find this when I'm looking for it. And I think I really should give it a, a certain label because I reference it. I don't know how many times, but um, I mean, just look there. Uh, the new king, king and queen, the mom who will be queen, the next queen, king and queen, the new king and queen, king and queen, preparing for the throne, meet the new queen, queen Kate, king and queen. Kate prepares to be queen. Uh, let me see. Royal mom, future queen. Uh, let's see here. Take the throne. Catherine, a portrait of a queen. And lastly, uh, what is that again? Is that a portrait of the future queen? Now, they have been taunting Charles and Camilla with these articles. And at the time, uh, Buckingham Palace said nothing. Now, these were written while the queen was still alive. And so maybe that's why Charles didn't bother. But it's a new dawn, it's a new day, and there is a new king. And they are not tolerating that nonsense from Kensington Palace. 
These articles, these puff pieces, are expressly written with the consent of Kensington Palace. They're, they were shaping the image as though they were trying to build a case to get Charles to, and I was convinced, I, I'm going to just tell you, I was wrong, but I was convinced that they were going to try to shame Charles away from that throne that they were going to come up with something to make him say, you know what, this whole King thing was cute, but I'm out of here. I thought that that was the plan because I couldn't understand why they would allow this type of rhetoric to continue week after week after week. But now we know that the truth is Camilla was going to do everything. Camilla is the queen. Charles may be a consort to the queen at this point. I mean, not legally, not officially, but I guess in a very roundabout way, that's how it's worked out. Now, uh, this is, oh, this is it right here. Inside Meghan Markle and Kate Middleton, part three. That is the podcast, the infamous inside America's biggest. Oh, let me see the infamous inside America's biggest. I don't know why that's the well, anyway, but I don't get the cover that they have there, but that is it right there. So while Natalie and Vanessa were researching Meghan Markle, another royal scandal took over the internet. Kate Middleton disappeared from public view unleashing a flood of speculation and conspiracy theories only to reappear with the shocking and emotional revelation that she has a cancer diagnosis. Natalie and Vanessa chat with Anna Postanak, uh, a future, I'm sorry, a fantastic, that is, biographer who profiled the Duchess of Cambridge in a controversial Tatler piece and look at the complex relationship between the press and the monarchy in Great Britain. So that is the article. Again, I will put the actual link on the community tab. Now this right here, Prince Philip used to call Meghan Markle D-O-W in private nickname for uh, the Duchess of Sussex, which means um, the Duchess of Windsor, right? And interestingly enough, this is the anniversary of Philip's death, and they spent a big chunk of it talking about Meghan. And as you can see, back in February, Prince Philip called Meghan um, the Duchess of Windsor because she reminded him of the Duchess of Windsor, and the Queen thought her Givenchy wedding dress was too white for a divorcee, writes Ingrid Sewer. Sewer, yeah. Uh, in her revolution, uh, I'm sorry, revelatory new book. Now, she talked about it then, right? She did the rounds talking about it then. So they invited her today to once again uh, target the Duchess of Sussex with this idea that a woman who lived, uh, was born 100 years ago, uh, should I say born 100 years ago and died back in what, the 70s, the 80s? This woman, uh, whose only real vocation was marrying someone with access to money and society, in some way is supposed to be a comparison to Megan. Yes, both Americans, yes, both have been divorced, but Megan is cut from a very different cloth. And of course, Megan was born into an African American tradition of hard work. And I do mean hands-on work, which is very different from um, the um, Duchess of Windsor because her whole thing was avoiding doing a day's work and just living off of her husband's money. You know, and I'm not uh, going after her for that because that's all she had. I mean, in those days, everybody was still living the Jane Austen life. And that was the best she could do. She was raised in a good family, but her part of the family did not have money. 
So when you think about it like that, I think she was more like Philip and less like uh, Megan. Okay. She was more like Philip and less like Megan, someone accustomed to the good life, but didn't have any money. Megan was accustomed to hard work and Megan had her own money. So who's more like the Duchess of Windsor? I ask you, is it Megan or is it the Duke of Windsor? Someone that nobody liked when he arrived. People were suspicious of him. He came from nowhere and had nothing. They used to refer to him as the penniless Duke. How come we didn't discuss the penniless Duke? There were people who were against the queen marrying Philip. The only reason why they wed was because Louis Mountbatten, the big pervert, uh, Louis Mountbatten pushed and connived and, and conjoled and, and conspired to get Philip in that household so that the Mountbatten name would reign over Britain right alongside the name Windsor. And of course, just like the uh, royal family's uh, real name, it wasn't fit for the British people. So they anglicized the name um, Battenberg and turned it into Mount Batten so that it sounds more Anglo. I'm telling you, they are trying to, to make this thing about Wallace Simpson and Megan. But when you look at the, the, the real story, then you find out it was Philip who had nothing, who needed to marry up. He needed to marry money. He had nothing. His father was a joke. Oh, I guess they got that in common, huh? Uh, Wallace's father was a jerk. Philip's father was a jerk. And Megan's father is a jerk. So that's something that they all share in common. But again, this is the anniversary of Philip's death. So they're not going to talk about that. So uh, there you have it. Uh, Prince Philip, uh, the Prince of Greece and Denmark, who came to the royal family with nothing. And Philip, of course, is buried right on top of George VI. And uh, Queen Elizabeth is buried, I guess, on, stacked on top of her mama. Uh, the queen mother. And so that is the, um, that is the uh, thing that covers their grave right there. This is actually uh, a replica, but the uh, real one, of course, looks very identical. I think the lettering may be a little smaller on the actual um, tombstone, but this is a, I think it's black Belgium granite and it goes on top of the vault. And um, yeah, so that's that's it right there. And then, of course, right here, Duke of Edinburgh's will to remain secret for at least 90 years to protect the dignity and standing of the queen the high court has ruled. It has been a uh, convention for over a century that after the death of a senior member of the royal family, the courts are asked to seal their wills. It means that unlike most wills granted probate, it will not be open to public inspection. There will be a private process in 90 years to decide if it can be unsealed. Well, I, I don't know why they feel the need to do that. I mean, what does he have to hide? an explanation as to what happened to 30 million pounds. Like, how did he get 30 million pounds? What happened to the 30 million pounds upon his death? He certainly didn't leave it to his son, uh, Charles. So what happened to the rest of the money? But then there is Penny Natchbull, who is considered to be a friend and confidant, as well as someone who seems to have confused the gear shift with other things. Uh, <laughs> someone who had a prominent uh, position at Philip's funeral. Yeah. Someone who cannot seem to sort out the gear shift. Penny Natchbull. Yep. 
I don't know why I look at that picture and all I hear is, <laughs> anyway, uh, there you are. The first time that they ever really got close back in 1975. And there they are riding on a motorbike in the year 2000. And fast forward to the gear shift. Now, if that would have ended with a cigarette, I would be blushing right now. If that would have ended with a cigarette, I, I would actually be uh, blushing right now. I would find myself a, a little uh, lost for words at this point. But I'm going to assume that, um, well, we figured out what neutral and park is. And after that, I guess they went off to the Piggly Wiggly or Tesco's or something like that. Surely they did. Uh, AI, uh, if you ask AI to demonstrate an image of Philip, uh, this is the way they f uh, picture Philip, either as some downtrodden hobo or had he been born under other circumstances, maybe uh, the leader of some like L.A. street gang or something. <laughs> Yes, either either some uh, hobo living in a shanty town by the river, or a kingpin of some L.A. Uh, street gang. Either way, I'm sure he would be just as charming under whatever circumstance. Amen. Yeah, it's something about Philip. He always seems to have his charm, no matter what. <laughs> And of course, let us not forget the Duke of Hazard. Let us not forget the Duke of Hazard. He who broke that woman's arm. I one of my favorite stories about Philip was when his car became jettisoned at that uh, intersection, and he broke that poor woman's arm. I mean, smashed it to bits. Uh, Philip was crossing from one side of the estate to the other. How many people have been in traffic court and they said, well, your honor, I was crossing from one side of Great Windsor Park to the other. I was trying to get back to Wood Farm um, to Penny Natchpool and I don't care. Anyway, number one, uh, Prince Philip pulls out of, what is that, the whatever, in his Land Rover just before 3 p.m. Two, the Duke who later admitted to the cops that he had been uh, dazzled by the sun moments before the crash is T-boned by a Kia. Number three, the 97-year-old spins on the road, flipping onto his side. And number four, flipping 180 degrees, the Land Rover comes to a rest on the driver's side. Yeah, and there's Philip in there hanging upside down, yelling, Get this effing thing off of me. Um, <laughs> and so I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, the Duke of Hazard. Yep. The Duke of Hazard. There he is, deuces. <laughs> uh, and that's the poor woman right there. That poor woman. Um that that unfortunate creature found herself with a broken arm and no apology. She even appeared on this morning and told them about how uh, Prince Philip, it, actually, her account is different from his. It is alleged that he didn't even stop. He just shot right through the intersection. So whatever the case may be, um, she's on the road to the mend. And actually, she has... Been, she's healed and she's okay now. And of course, Philip, well, he's um, over at the St. George Chapel resting in eternal peace. Just waiting for Camilla to be stacked on top of him. And right here, the sun, uh, right here, you can see Prince Philip's service was tinged by a note of regret, the absence of Prince Harry. Very misogynist because. 
if it's about Harry, why are you showing Meghan? Then the other one, why does Prince Harry think is safer in the Netherlands than UK? Ex-Royal Protection Officer Ken Wharf uh, says Duke faces a larger threat at Invictus game than Phillips Memorial Service he claimed was too dangerous. Uh, Harry never said that Phillips Service was too dangerous. Uh, Harry was trying to work out things with his security. That is putting words in Harry's mouth. I am more than certain Harry did not say that. Uh, and then also, Prince Harry would be the, uh, a distraction at Phillips Memorial Service. So right here, you, you can see they don't want him to show up. Then they say he's going to be a distraction. Let me see. British public disappointed Prince Harry didn't attend Phillips uh, Service. You didn't want him to come. You just said he would be a distraction. Now you're upset that he didn't come. And then here, emergency bid to a, I'm sorry, um, after missing memorial for Philip, Megan uh, to jet to Holland with Harry. Um, from all accounts, the security in the Netherlands was as tight as a net's behind. So with that, they had nothing to worry about. But we all know that in the UK, that at the time, things were a bit different where Harry's security is concerned. I'm sure they've worked out some things now, but just they don't want the entire family to come over. I think that is uh, the standing protocol is that they don't want the entire family to come over. So there you have a caricature of Prince Philip. I'm 80 bloody five <laughs> no <laughs> i guess this must have been for his 80th birthday or his 85th birthday i'm 80 bloody five now anyway i tell you i almost thought that this was a uh hd 4k image of philip because it looks just like him the big ears the can opener nose the uh, chin jutting out from his face, uh, the eyebrows that look like the wings of a condor, or to put it uh, mildly, Philip. That's Philip. Okay, so Philip uh, died at age 99, didn't quite make it to his 100th birthday, and um, of course, they spent the day talking about what he thought of Megan. Also, I should tell you guys, um, I did not get an opportunity to screenshot uh, the comments uh, that came along with, um, where is it? This, uh, when they were talking about uh, Philip here, uh, Eamon Holmes and what's her face? At least half the comments were, why are you making it about Megan? This was a nice story until you started talking about Megan. If it's Philip's anniversary uh, for his passing, why is Megan part of the story? And so one of the people actually commented that that was the only way to get people to pay attention to it. I mean, as you know, there was not much commentary about Philip today anywhere because, for the most part, nobody cares. And even when he died, they were trying to build up all of this um, grief and such for Philip that just did not exist. Uh, people had moved on. And just like with the Queen, you wouldn't know she was on the throne for 70 years. Islander Jen says, I told you people look like uh, an extra, uh, oh, Prince Philip looks like an extra for <laughs> Dark Crystal. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Islander Jen. <laughs> okay, and let me see, where did I leave off? Not there, not there. That poor woman, that poor woman. I mean, I don't know what her dating life is like or her social calendar, but 
having that broken arm couldn't help. Okay. And right here, um, in regards to um, Tina Brown, uh, you can make anything up about the royal family and it will be printed as fact. There are no compelling new witnesses or discoveries in Tina Brown's much hyped book, but plenty of repeated implausible gossip. I like that. At this point, one starts to think that volumes of royal muckery, muckraking that is, uh, that you can make up anything and have a five, uh, I'm sorry, a fair chance of, being of it being repeated. If it said in this review that I happen to know that all the uh, Prince of Wales siblings were in the habit of referring to him among themselves as, what is that? Blow, what? Any, blowin, blowin, a blot, well, I cannot pronounce that. I dare say it would soon find its way into print as a matter of fact. Thank you, um, Philip Hinscher. Yeah, so that is how someone described Tina Brown's book. Uh, Tina Brown did just what all of the other uh, royal rota, royal rodent, uh, royal authors, royal experts, just rehashing things that everybody already knows. Uh, Raffaella Bertoni, thank you so much for the super sticker, and thank you for watching. Royal Sussex. Now, um, I'm not going to read through these, but this is one day, I believe this was in 2022. In one day, the Daily Mail had 31 articles about um, Harry and Meghan. The Sun had 28 articles that same day. And the Daily Express 50 articles on the same day. See that? 31, 28, and 50. Mostly negative articles. Mostly negative articles. And if you think Tina, ha Tina Brown rehashes things, you can pretty much look at all of these articles and you'll find that they're rehashing stuff, just like with the um, Ingrid Sewer saying that um, Philip thought of uh, Megan as the um, uh, Duchess of Windsor. That is everything they report. It's all rehash. At any given time, they will uh, show Harry in the uniform thing, they will talk about Las Vegas, um, Megan's um, nail polish, whatever. They will find something to rehash. And with that, you guys, I am done. One hour, 25 minutes. As you can see, I kept it on a very smooth pace. Connie Bomber! Hey, Connie Bomber. Good morning. Good morning. I knew, I knew that the sun was going to rise this morning because Connie Balmer is awake. That usually means sunshine. Okay. Uh, so with that, you all, I'm not going to drag it out. I'm going to say good night to you and thank you all very much for being here. Um, mm -mm -mm. Let me see. Go here. Let me put something on the screen. There we go. Thank you to the Mod Squad uh, for keeping this a um, Sussex-friendly safe space. There we go. My computer is, like, lagging. I think it's the interweb. But, yeah, there you go. Thanks for keeping this a safe space. And also, whenever you see our queens, it is time to go. And you know what I mean? Yes, our queens. And take a look at a couple of your comments here. Okay.
Uh, yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, they have rewritten so much of the history as we know it. And I think what's really done a lot of damage is the crown. The crown will become a go-to reference for the royal family. And while it may not all be flattering to them, it's telling the story the way they want it told, no matter what anybody says. I think that the palace uh, in symbolically signed off on the crown, especially the last few seasons. And so um, I'm hoping that someone will uh, tell the truth about Diana. I hope in the future that there will be uh, books that are written by uh, in a more flattering um, way about Diana in a more truthful, flattering way. But they have, Diana has, has been killed several times. Diana has been killed several times. Once physically removed from this world and the rest, her uh, image, her likeness, her story has been butchered. That's the only way I can put it. It's uh, really too bad, but um, that William can live with himself and live within that institution and and give favor to those same people that made his mother's life miserable. Um, my hope is that someday it will be paid forward to him and that everything that his father has been going through in terms of his um, fight for the um, rehabilitation of his public image, uh, William is going to have to do the same. He's going to have to do the same. Um, right now, they're controlling the message, but at some point, William is going to be just as desperate as his father to try to rewrite um, history and try to control his public image. I, I think it's false to believe that so many people have a favorable opinion about him. They just simply could not if they actually know anything about William. So I don't know how they do their polls and who they're polling. But um, I think most people in Britain know who William is and know how he is and don't think a lot of him. And uh, one of these days is, is going to, um, is going to be a talking point. Um, and people are going to discuss it openly. Yeah, they're going to discuss it openly. I'm looking forward to that. Well, thank you for the last word, uh, Beverly McCaskill. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Stay warm. Take care. And remember, no bad energy. Energy, that energy. No bad energy. <laughs> Love you all. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And good night, everyone. Let me cue up the Ginger Avenger, and I will see you all tomorrow.